I have never had less than 80% of my money in American business. You can call them stocks. One way to get this additional capital is to sell more stocks to many more people. Buy low, sell high, that's my motto. I may just quit my job at the power plant and become a full-time stock market guy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode 61 of Pounding the Table. I am back with my co-host, Joey Salitro, back in the booth a little bit early this week because I got another wedding this weekend, back-to-back weekends, and giving Tony one more week with his family before he joins us as the three-headed monster here on Pounding the Table. We're going to kick things off going through stock twits, trending tickers of the week, dive into Salesforce earnings, and crack open Joey's brain to get a bit of understanding how he evaluates companies before adding to his portfolio. For those of you who are new and have not checked out stock twits, it's our favorite place to go every single day, check out the pulse of the markets. Not only does it give us the key highlights of the week and the trending tickers, what everyone's talking about, but the banter is incredible. They got a new trading platform and really makes us proud to have them as a partner and truly an incredible sponsor to work with. So again, it's totally free to check out. So if you have not yet joined, check us out on stocktwits.com and join us on the conversation. All right, Joe, are you ready? We got the uh, trending stock twit tickers of the week. All right. Well, you know, I'm going to kick it right back to you because we're starting off with Bitcoin. And I know you're you have a much better pulse on the crypto world than I do. So and they do call me crypto of uh, now. So obviously with the crypto markets, you know, just focusing on Bitcoin and Seoul, I think hit the headlines here after UST and Terra took the headlines the past few weeks, right? Bitcoin's showing some solid strength over the past week. It's up almost 5%, I think four and a half last I checked. But you know, this is a t- tale as a whole time where people keep thinking crypto's dead. But if you just Google, you look at the regulations being put in place, look at everything, all the institutions coming into the market. Sure, it's going to have its ups and downs, but the institutions are now coming into the market and that means a lot more money. So, you know, certainly not making any calls on where it's going to go from a price perspective, but the industry as a whole is certainly thriving and people are pouring money. If you look at all the VCs tossing money into new applications to really make it easier. Crypto in general is confusing for a lot of folks. I know my mom has no idea even what Bitcoin means or (laughs) what that word means. So we'll continue to give you updates on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the markets as a whole. Solana is one that we've certainly touched on, right? They had their seventh outage just recently. And so they were just getting tons and tons of bots going on, tons of data that essentially crashed it. And so it's gone from its highs of 250 over the past couple of months down to $40 right now. So a lot of these secondary coins that people think of in their head, there's a lot of turbulence that we've seen over the past couple of weeks that I think is going to scare a few people, but it's a new technology. Anytime that happens, there's a complete shift in financial markets. There's going to be some hiccups along the way. Uh, last thing here, and then I'll kick it over to you. USO gas prices, obviously at a new all-time high. There was some news with Europe and, and Russia. So when it comes to oil prices, you know, when you have a major producer like Russia causing issues, I mean, I don't foresee oil coming down significantly until we we really get some sort of resolution over there. I saw someone on Twitter post, you know, gas prices in Southern California going over eight bucks a gallon. So you can see, you know, if people are spending so much more going places, you know, they might be more selective where they're going, might stay in a little bit more. So I mean, unless it starts hitting gas price over here, I think we're still, you know, high fours that if it did say reach in the eights where I'm at, and I, I know it would impact our behavior a little bit, but for now, I'm still of the mindset where we're on lockdown for so long that I still want to go places and, and get out there. So yeah, it might but adjust what about the shipping costs, right? Like how, how does that impact the transportation costs? Obviously, have to go up, right? The cost of gas is going up. So, does that then trickle down into the price of all these goods? I think it has to. You see different retailers with uh, margin impact, and they're trying to pass along the cost to consumers as much as they can. And I know I'm, I'm for sure paying more at the grocery store, just like we're paying more at the pump. I feel like even ordering, you know, like protein off of Amazon, you know, anybody that does that, you've seen the the cost has rise significantly, and that I think goes hand in hand, you know, with baby formula shortage, because, you know, all these ingredients to go into there, it's just, it's, it's a major issue. So not only rising costs, limited supply, I think we're going to face this for a while. And it doesn't seem like our administration really has any of this under control. So I mean, hopefully we see a resolution. But for the time being, I think it, it's something that we're going to face for quite some time. 
Yeah, I'm seeing it with with flights prices. I should have bought a hundred flights during COVID when they're all a hundred dollars, and now you're looking at flights. I have all these weddings I'm flying to. It's like eight hundred dollars a flight. It's it's pretty crazy. And then on top of that, I just dealt with a five thirty wake up and try to go to the airport, and my flight's canceled. I do want to just give a quick shout out to DeAndre who is out of Salt Lake City that works at Delta. If you're listening or anyone that works at Delta, give her a raise. She was incredible today. Help me out. Speaking of flights, though, the flight from Cheryl Sandberg here, she left Facebook and Facebook took a little dip. Both you and I both had the same feeling here on that, that it was not that big of a deal if you want to dive into that a little. Yeah, I was actually picking up my daughter from school when I saw Facebook just start moving significantly lower. I think it, it was down you know, three, four, five percent on this announcement. And it was that Sheryl Sandberg, the longtime COO of Facebook, is stepping down from her role. And, you know, I, I think that was all algorithmic trading right there, you know, just trading the headline because I think everybody knew she was gonna leave very soon. We just didn't, you know, we didn't know the exact day. Um, and you even see in the press release, she starts talking about, you know, she wants to get bigger into philanthropy and, you know, she planned on being in the job for five years and she's there for 14. I know she had some personal issues along the way, like she had her husband pass away. And so, I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons she could have left a long time ago. And she, she kind of stuck by, I, I think she stuck by Mark's side because, you know, they've had so many different issues pop up that they kind of mm-hmm. needed her to be that, you know, other adult in the room that people could turn to and focus on. And she's kind of been like a, a guiding light for Mark Zuckerberg as he finds himself as a CEO, you know, going from the kid in the sweatshirt to who he is now. I think, it, you know, it's just time. And she's doing a very slow transition, bringing someone else in the role that's very experienced. So yeah, while a big figure is finally leaving Facebook, I mean, it's not like she's just leaving out of nowhere and not leaving abruptly. She's going to make sure this is smooth and that, you know, the company's in good hands. MongoDB crushed it on their earnings, up 57% on revenue. You mentioned that their guidance is better than expected as well, yeah? Yep. They provide a Q2 guide that came in above analyst expectations. And you know, I've, I've owned MongoDB for years now. It's just one of those they continue to deliver. It's just one of those compound growth monsters. It's just another great quarter in the books for them and a very bright future. So this is one that I've thought about adding to. It's a weird environment to be adding to tech stocks, especially ones that I've owned for so long that I'm just kind of letting that position sit and never going to sell any of that one, at least no plans to have now unless the situation changes, but an incredible quarter all around. We got the meme stocks coming up, GameStop and AMC. Let's put those both together. AMC got the Top Gun hype coming up. Jimmy just had their earnings and both of those are up 10, 11%. So are you buying into the, the Top Gun hype or the, the meme stock hype again? I would never touch any of these meme stocks. And it's interesting. It, the movie theaters, they were said to be dead for the longest time. And I'm seeing nonstop, everybody's saying they're going out to see the movie. So I think movie theaters are alive and well. Now, I don't know about the individual operators or the financials within these individual stocks. I know that I guess the idea or the activity of going to the movies is still alive and well. But there is still the huge group of people that want to wait for it to you know, hit one of the streaming services to watch. So while I think when it comes to this industry, it's more like there's too many movie theaters. Maybe if they cut down the number of locations, like it could be one of those you know, cash cow type businesses. It's just one of those that I don't want exposure to in my portfolio because I think there's bigger industries that are growing faster that you can find these you know, compounders within. Going to the movie theater is not something that's going away, but it's also not one that I'm itching the exposure to. Same with GameStop, where they reported decent results at best. I think this is still yeah, entirely driven by meme stock mania. And I think they're having a meeting this week as well, where they're approving the issuance of more shares so they can do a stock split. So, you know, I think that is another catalyst that could be coming for them and give, you know, the meme traders some more ammunition to drive the stock higher. But again, it's not it's not like memes or, you know, retail sentiment on Reddit or anything like that that actually provides fundamental basis for owning the stock. Mm -hmm. So while I'll continue to watch all the meme stocks, it's not something that I'm chasing or itching to get into. Yeah. Those are trader stocks, in my opinion. You have to be in front of the screen and grab the momentum because it's purely run, like you're saying, from a lot of these Reddit rooms and people just ape into it you're talking about. But one thing I was just thinking about with this Top Gun movie, maybe Hollywood actually starts going in and changing the types of movies that they're putting out because 
for example, like that's a movie you'd want to see in the theater, right? It's, it's a lot of crazy action and things like that. So I wonder if in general, we'll start shifting the movies towards movies that you'd have to see in the theater versus all these sad movies that you see on Netflix. A little sidetracked, but that was just a thought that was on my mind. No, I mean, that does make sense because you see, you know, Disney could focus on putting more of like the kids movies that don't have as much hype or like the newer ones directly on Disney Plus. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if they come out with another Frozen, yeah, put that thing in the theater because every kid's just going to be begging to go see it. So, you yeah, you can almost see like where stores have a different product mix based on, you know, the taste of the consumer where, you know, they're buying more groceries, less consumer electronics as prices rise that, yeah, maybe movie theaters do the same thing, only put them with you know, the absolute superstars or something that's as hyped up as a, as a top gun. So we, yeah, well, we got a little sidetrack there. It does make perfect sense for them to be more strategic with their selection of what they put in there. It's almost like the big corporations making a parallel to that. Like the big blockbusters are going to be in theater as well. Almost like a lot of these retail stores are now going direct online. It's almost like that same kind of concept in a sense. But all right, enough about movies. Uh, let's get over to Salesforce. Ticker symbol CRM, up 10% on earnings. Going to give myself a little pat on the back. I was talking about it a week ago or two weeks ago. I'm getting a little flack from, from Tony there, but up from 160 to 180 at the time of this podcast. They beat on EPS, 98 per share versus the estimates of 94%. Revenues were up 7.41 billion versus the estimates of 7.38 billion. And Salesforce is one of those companies that we were talking about this last week where you can't just rip out Salesforce from an organization. So the, the current customers that they have are only going to continue to get bigger, but they're also adding a ton of different acquisitions that are continuing to grow their offering, right? Datarama, MuleSoft in the past couple of years, Tableau, Acumen, Slack, obviously being the biggest one recently. And so they're adding all of these tools, which is making this massive tank, as I always call them. And they're just continuing to grow across their CDP platform. Slack, as I mentioned, they just did 348 million in Q1 compared to the 330 million, which was the estimates. The biggest number I'm kind of looking at too is who are their big customers, right? A number spending over 100,000 grew 45% year on year, their fourth consecutive up quarter. They did you know, spend quite a bit, 27.7 billion to make this acquisition. But as I've personally seen, and we were discussing this before the show, I'm using email less and less, and I am using Slack more and more. And while I thought this acquisition initially was a bit crazy, I'm starting to see their predictions and they're bad, essentially, that email is going to slowly start to go away. And you can do a lot of what you can do in email now within Slack. And the biggest thing that I'm seeing personally, you know, being in the tech world, is it's no longer just internal. Like I'm actually having conversations outside of my organization now. You go where people are going, right? And people are going for these instant gratification type of communication. And that's something that I'm seeing continuing to go. I'm talking to customers on Telegram even, you know? And so it is something that I could see continuing to grow in that segment specifically of Salesforce. Not sure if you wanted to add anything to to what you saw here in the earnings. Yeah, Salesforce is just one of those you know, gold standard type technology platforms. And it's an absolute monster. I know every time they make an acquisition, they question, you know, why they're doing it. But I think anybody that uses Slack knows that email is one of the worst things in the world. Anything I can move from email to Slack, I will do. So yeah, I I didn't know people have, they're still questioning MuleSoft's acquisition. And I think Tableau people realized that that was just a no brainer for them. But you know, Salesforce, they, they've just built this incredible platform where so many different technologies plug into it. And they're almost like picking and choosing which ones to acquire to enhance it. So I think, you know, this is just one of those companies that they're generating so much cash and they're putting that cash to work to put back in the business and, and accelerate growth. So Mark yeah, Benioff, I've always said, you know, if there's a Mount Rushmore of software, Mark Benioff is on there just because he transformed the industry and you see they just continue to deliver. So I, yeah. I don't think Salesforce is one of those companies that you have to buy and worry about. I think you just can buy that, sleep well at night, knowing that this is an absolute monster that still has a, a very long path of growth ahead of them. Yeah, he's, he's another one. I know you're talking about Sheryl Sandberg getting into more philanthropy and we were touching on she may get into politics. He's always toyed with the idea of becoming mayor. I've heard rumors of him running for president at some point. So we could see this trend of, uh, you know, these rock stars of our generation for these tech companies starting to get into politics a bit more. Early on episodes with Pound on the Table, we kind of cracked open Tony's brain, got a little bit of 
the bonsai, how he looks at companies, looks for a lot of growth names, right? And so while that was amazing in 2020 and in 2021, you know, some of those growth names now have been hit, right? And so I'm curious too, from your perspective, I know you've been around for 12, 13 years investing yourself. So everyone has a little of their own flavor and no one's right or wrong necessarily, but I'd love to crack open your brain, uh, that shiny head of yours and, and start to understand a bit when you're looking at companies, building out your portfolio, like what types of things are you looking at? Yeah. So for the longest time, you know, I, I got caught up like everybody else, you know, you almost get caught up in the hype of a company. You see, oh, this company's grown at such an incredible rate. You know, I got to own a piece of this, all the new hot IPOs. And I realized quickly that you've got to focus on companies that have that staying power, that have the long-term ability to compound at very high rates. But the big thing that people miss out on is you've got to see that path to profitability and the path to you know, generating a lot of cash flow. So then they can use that to make acquisitions, somehow reinvest in the business to you know, keep the growth going. So one way to do this is you know, try to shift away from just the softwares and focus more on you know the platforms and infrastructure that others build on. So you can look at Salesforce as another example of this, where you know they were a great you know customer relationship management service, like a SaaS company, but they transformed mm-hmm. over time to where they were the platform that all these other technologies plug into and almost like enhance the Salesforce platform. You can see the same use case in like a HubSpot, where you know it's like these SaaS turned pass. And, and that's where you could really see these companies take off. So one thing I'll always do is, could this software be a platform and more so focusing on the, the platforms themselves or you know the companies that are more like infrastructure, like a MongoDB? So yeah, we almost need to do an entire show trying to show you how I'll break down a company. But from a high level perspective, these companies that have the ability to become the platforms of the future. And I, I think I'll leave you with you know one little thought of, you know, look up the rule of 40. There's a lot of different ways to you know, make this work, but it's essentially taking the revenue growth along with a uh, profitability mark using the operating margin. You can almost pair the revenue growth with the operating margin, make sure that it exceeds 40. So with these companies early on, you know, they might be losing a lot of money. So operating margins negative. So you got to make sure the revenue growth is significant enough to offset that and you know, exceed the number 40. But then sometimes you'll find these companies that are actually break even on operating margin or largely positive to go with strong revenue growth. So that's when you could look out and see, okay, you know, what's the total addressable market of this company? Are they expanding into more industries or other areas within that industry to be able to accelerate that growth or make it more significant going forward? So, you know, we'll have to do a full show where we could spotlight, you know, four or five companies that you know, pass this test with flying colors, plus have these massive markets ahead of them. But that is one that I think if you're looking for something or like a rule to follow, especially in this environment where you're looking for high quality, even as you know, we, we've somewhat had a rally this week, there's still a lot of companies that pass this test and have, you know, those bright futures. So mm-hmm. that's where I'd leave it for now. Heading on over to earnings tonight, we got CrowdStrike is a big one, Lululemon, Okta, Restoration Hardware, Asana. Another short episode this week. Hopefully uh, you guys like these quicker episodes. They're fun for us. Much easier to uh, edit and easier to record. So let us know what you guys think. But Joey, as always, leave us some thoughts here to think about in the upcoming week, given that we have finally seen a little bit of green. I know people are starting to throw a little more emojis out there on FinTwit. People are getting a little excited, but you know, last week we said to keep one eye open still. Has things shifted in your mind or are you still a little hesitant before going all in right now? Well, so when I look at, you know, even two weeks ago when we were in the seventh consecutive week slide on the S&P, you know, nothing's really changed since then. It's just felt like we were so beaten down. We were just due for a couple up weeks. So, I mean, yeah, we were green last week. It's looking good so far this week. But it, you know, I go back to even a sh- chart that you showed me from the 1920s and the chart that I was telling you about from like 2008, 2009, where you know during the large, long bear markets, we had significant upside five or six times where you saw like 10% bounce, 15% bounce, 8% bounce, stuff like those, where I hate to say that's what it feels like right now. But I mean, I really don't see that anything has fundamentally changed that we can say definitively a bottom is in go buy everything. I don't feel that right now. I'm more of the mindset where 
you know, I, I want to trade around my core positions where I might put on a, a couple trades that then, you know, if they surge, try to get out of those, but, you know, just maintain my core holdings that I don't touch. But yeah, I, I would love to say that, hey, we're going to make it three consecutive up weeks next week, but there's really no reason to other than we were so beaten down. So I would say and echo the same thing over and over, focus on, you know, accumulating quality, dollar cost average over time. If you're going to trade, just trade around your core positions and, you know, keep a short leash on those. But this is more of a market where you want to go with the flow and not try to chase the rallies and then get stuck selling into dips and then continually shoot yourself in the foot. Love it. I definitely want to dive into more around how you trade around your core positions. because I found that extremely interesting. All right, Joey, that wraps things up for this week of Pounding the Table. Check out StockTwits.com. Again, give a shout out to our sponsor. We will be back next week for another episode of Pounding the Table. That's a big move. Big money, big moves. That's a big move. Yeah. Make a play, don't talk about it. Master P, I'm about it, about it. This one here for all that try to count me out and they still counting. Honestly, I never doubt it. Say the top is never crowded. Well, I'm trying to climb the mountain till I need a few accountants. Stock is rising, perfect timing. I'm in brickle with the tribe. Shawty sliding, she won't sue. She